Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Can we all stand in the house this morning, this afternoon, this night, whatever it is? Amen. Good looking crowd on this Wednesday night. Glad to see everybody here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get right into prayer tonight. Is there anybody got any prayer requests over here on this side? Anybody? Sister Rita? Anybody else here? Anybody here in the middle? Uncle Johnny? All right, Brother Luke. Okay, Sister Eloise. Yes, ma'am. Angel? All right. Brother Owen? Yes, sir, we will. We'll remember him in Jesus' name. Uh, Mamma? Yes, ma'am. Let's remember both of them. Brother Derek? Yes, sir. Let's continue to remember Brother Derek's mom also. Um, Brother Skipper? Yes, sir. We will. Sister Scarlett? Okay. Anybody else here in the middle that I miss? Sister Leanne? Yes, ma'am. All right. Anybody over here on this side? Sister Maria? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am, we will. Sister Nadine. Yes, ma'am. Sister. Yes, ma'am, we will. Sister Sherry? We sure will. Sis? name yes we sure will did I miss anybody out here sister Stephanie sorry yes ma'am we sure will is there anybody up here brother Richard Praise the Lord for that. Brother Larry. All right. That's just kind of God I serve. 
Amen. And I believe that after we pray tonight, there's going to be some more stories coming in. Amen. 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 Sis? Yes, ma'am, we will. Yes, ma'am, always in our prayers. Amen. I, I believe that God's up to something. I, I, I was just... Uh, I was just listening to a song before church started when I was getting ready that just lifted my faith up that he's still moving. When we're talking about all these miracles and all these things that happen in the Bible, they still are happening today. Just like Brother Richard just said, they're still happening every day. And I believe that we're going to start hearing more and more reports of them. So if we can, pray with that kind of faith that you expect it to happen. If we can right now, Lord, God, I come before you with a thankful heart for what you have done, for what you have, uh, Brother Richard just testified about. God, for, for things that the devil did not see that could happen, you made a way. God, even the things we can't see could happen, you made a way. Lord, these people that have been sick and, and had cancers and, and tumors and so many different diseases and stuff that have just cleared up or went away or the doctors couldn't find it. God, I believe that you can still do them same miracles, that you still move the same mountains. God, and I pray in that every request, there's many of them, so many tonight. God, so many different sicknesses, so many different diseases, so many different cancers or, or situations in people's life and, and traumatic events and losses and depression and anxiety and, and so many different stresses of this life. God, I pray, though, with that same faith, of that, the same faith that we've seen you perform miracles before, that you're going to see it. We're going to see it done now. God, I believe that the next services and the services after that, we're going to see reports flood in of heal healings, uh, of sicknesses that are gone, of people that needed strength in their body that receive it, that people that, are, that can't see, they're going to be healed. God, that people that have cancer, that they're going to go back to the doctor and it's going to be gone. God, that people that have problems with their eyes, that it's just going to be completely healed in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you so much for what you have done, and I thank you in advance for the miracles that are coming. In the name of Jesus.
clap your hands. be seated. We're going to take up our tithing and offering at this time. we got several different ways. Givelify, PayPal, it's at riverbendpentecostals.com. Cash and checks can be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. We also have text to give, and that number is up on the, the screen at 833 833- Eight eight three nine three one one, and uh, before she or as she's getting the prayer up, I'll say I want to just give another little couple testimonies, and it's nothing to do with the words that we even say, but it's just from pure obedience and faith that when we say these this prayer, when we obey and say it, God does stuff, but. Uh, just recently, I could tell you, if, if I really got down pen and paper, and, and Dad knows way more than me, but there's so many different testimonies that have come in and reports of financial blessings, gifts, surprises, checks in the mail, so many different things. Uh, prodigals returning. Come on, we neglect that sometimes. But so many different blessings have happened because of our faith. But uh, recently, I went to work, and my boss told me, hey, you should get your bonus this check. And I said, well, what bonus? And he says, ah, you, you're just getting a bonus. Well, and I had a, Uncle Shannon, I had a number kind of in my head that like, okay, I'll probably get this amount. Ended up being 10 times that. Amen. And that's just, that's just the first thing. That's just the first thing. Ended up uh, like a week or two later, I, the Lord just managed to, to make it to where a bill that I owed, a debt that I owed, wiped clear for no, for no reason. No reason other than God. And, and I say all that, it's just money. That's, that's not even the things I'm worried about. But we're seeing revival happen in our life and in our communities. We're seeing families restored. We're seeing people come back. We're seeing new people coming, being restored in their life. Faith is being lifted. And, not, and not, not to mention all the things happening in your lives. God is up to something. Amen. So can we all stand and pray this prayer with faith? Just with a little more faith than what you had a second ago. Amen. Say it with me. Upon the authority of your word I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Press down, shaking together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received, my whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in and I am blessed going out. And all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, The wooden pan is for offering and the golden pans are for your tithing. Give as the Lord has given unto you and worship with his praise team.
Hallelujah. Can we offer him just a little bit of praise? I know it's a Wednesday night. Come on, I know it's a Wednesday night, but pastor preached, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Does anybody got some joy? Does anybody got the joy of the Lord in their life? Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. God, I praise you. I praise you on the mountain. God, I praise you in the valley. Oh, God, you are worthy of my praise. Hallelujah. Amen. As, a, uh, as we can get the children's church to come up to the front, just the children's church at this time also. We're going to do things just a little bit different tonight as far as how we pray for these young people and these younger people. I want us to pray right for these kids when you stretch out your, your hand up here. Uh, I, I just want to pray that they make themselves available. And I say that because many different times in the Bible, the, how many of you know the Lord loves children? And I'm reminded of when he fed the 5,000, he couldn't have done it if there wasn't a little boy that was available. And I say, I've seen it happen in my family's life. There's people that are here tonight because of kids. And no other reason but kids. And I believe that some of these people are going to, or some of these little kids are going to see their families coming. Some of these little kids are going to win some of their friends from school eventually. Since some of their teachers, some of their, the people that they come in contact with, they've got a world that, they, that they're involved in. And I just want to pray that they make themselves available and that they don't forget that who they are. So can we pray for them right now? Stretch your hand forth and let's pray for these children. God, I believe that they're, the children are a part of a revival. God, if there's no children, the generations will die out. God, and I believe that we have a revival that is here that we've not even seen the glimpse of yet. God, every child that is up here that has a family that, that needs saving, that has friends that need saving, that has a community. God, they've got friends at school. They've got teachers. They've got, they've got so many different people. They've got uh, people that watch them every day at daycare. They've got friends there. God, I believe that you're going to make them available in certain situations, that a child can speak into somebody's life, can speak wisdom or speak faith or, or bring them to their knees in a, in a way, God, into a repentant heart, that they can prick people's hearts with the faith that they have. God, I pray that they're available to you and that you use them for revival in their life, God, and I praise you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Y'all can go ahead and head on back to, to class. And while they're heading back, can we get the teenagers and the youth up here? And I, for them, I want us to just pray. Because so many times in, in men's prayer, and I don't know about women's prayer, but I got a feeling it's there too. And when we have hour of prayer, and when I'm praying personally, we battle our minds more than anything. It's, it's a mental battle. It's a spiritual mental battle. And that's where the devil tries to attack us most. And, and one thing that we forget is that these teenagers are facing it as much or if not more than what we have. Peer pressure, drugs, alcohol, sex, so many different things. The type of music that's out there now. So many different things that they battle every day. Getting made fun of or have to battle the, the thought of getting made fun of. And I've been there before. I felt like I was neglected. And in the, it's a battle of the mind that the devil tries to, and he's going to find, if he can find that one insecurity, he's jumping on it. And before you know it, by the time they're adults, they're fighting battles like we're fighting now. But we can nip this right now if we pray for them. Does anybody believe that your prayer can, it can change their life? That the, the battles that they fight mentally don't have to be as hard. So if we can, stretch out your hands toward the young people right now and let's pray for them. Lord, God, I pray right now with faith and high hopes, Lord, that we can pray and intercede for these young people. God, and that the battles that they fight on a day-to-day -day basis, that they don't have to be so hard anymore. God, that the, the devils that they fight at school, the devils that they fight when they're on their computers or when they're on their phones, the devils that they fight when they're hanging out with the wrong crowd, the devils that they fight that nobody knows when they're all alone. 
God, I pray against that. In the name of Jesus, I cast that out of them in the name of Jesus. I pray for pure minds, pure hearts, for only godly thoughts, for only godly things. God, and if they're placed in a situation that is ungodly, let it only be to make it godly. Let it only be to, to influence change, to influence the Spirit of God, to influence the Holy Ghost going forth and seeing revival. God, I believe that young people can be a, 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 an avenue of revival in this community. And I pray for your hand to be upon them right now. God, in the name of Jesus, protect them, protect their minds. In the name of Jesus, amen. Y'all can go on, head on back as pastor's going to teach. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Please be seated as, our, as my handout, handing out team is going to work. And, uh, uh, good to see everybody in church tonight. Amen. Doesn't it feel good to be here? Yes. Amen. I like what the, the praises that I heard going up. There's, uh, there's something happening when you begin to praise the Lord. And uh, uh, we are, uh, I just called this part three so y'all would think we was going somewhere. <laughs> so y'all would think we was moving along. Uh, I mean, I, I, I plan on getting done every time. I don't know that I ever have. But I'm still believing in a miracle. And uh, I uh, um, want to challenge you while they're handing out the papers between now and Sunday. Um, uh Spend a little purposeful extra time in prayer for revival. The Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against it. We got to make sure, we're going to talk about the carnal mind and the spiritual mind tonight. We got to make sure the Spirit has free reign in our lives. That's the only area I can control. It's my life, but uh, we're asking you to just pray. Might want you to put down on your calendars. Uh, I'd like you to be here all the time, but November the 20th, Brother Michael Burke is going to be preaching for us, and I'd like everybody to make 100% effort to be here. And then on December the 4th, Brother Parkey will be with us again, and I'm asking you, don't make plans on those days. Please, if you can, be here. And then also this Sunday night, is the rally. It's a revival rally here at the church. It begins with focused prayer at 454, then the service is at 5 o'clock, and I am begging you to be here. Please be here Sunday night. It's uh, Brother uh, uh, Nick Mahaney is going to be speaking. Um, I'm not sure that he will be able to give his testimony um, in, in that sort of a setting, but I plan to talk to him and bring him back at a later date because he has a recovery testimony that is out of this world, uh, the things that God has done in his life. So you, you want to be here and get acquainted with Brother Mahaney, and, uh, and we want to uh, be able to have a good showing at the rally. I have some friends that they don't like having rallies because their church embarrasses them by not showing up. So I don't want to be having the next Wednesday night be crying up here and stuff because I'm so sad and embarrassed. Hey Amen. I'm glad you're here. I feel, I feel the Spirit here. I feel the Lord here. And uh, uh, we're going to move into the carnal mind versus the spiritual mind. We're teaching a holiness series that involves... Uh, the inner man, the outer man, matter of fact, the whole man, or whole woe man, whatever your pleasure, but the carnal mind versus the spiritual mind. I'm going to try to be sim very simple tonight if I can. Sometimes I get carried away and uh, just, just, just go off like a balloon flying through the house, but I, I want to try to be very simple. I'm not going to do any review tonight over what we've covered in the previous few weeks, but here's what the carnal mind does. 
The carnal mind makes decisions according to what the body wants with no regard for the faith. And when I say the faith, I mean the entire body of beliefs that the Lord has given us, that the Bible gives us. So the carnal mind makes decisions simply what the body wants without any regard for the Lord and completely independent of what the spirit desires to do within them. That's what the carnal mind does. The carnal mind is basically, I'm my own boss. I can do what I want, when I want, how I want, and with whom I want, and can't nobody say anything to me about it. All right? It's against the Bible. If that's the way you feel, I'd like to invite you to get an opportunity to pray somewhere and get things right with God because you ain't going nowhere in the Lord. Okay. The spiritual mind, on the other hand, makes decisions according to what God wants or God wills in accord with the faith, in accord with who we are as believers in Christ Jesus and completely dependent upon what God desires to do as, and is in fact doing in them. The carnal mind, God's not working in you. The spiritual mind, he is. Now, here's where the, it gets a little bit righteous if you want to use it that way. The word mind here is the Greek word phronema, and it refers to the inner working that determines the outer behavior. Now, I'm in Romans chapter 8, verses 6 and 7, and it is the inner working that determines the outward behavior, and we decide if the motivating factor is my flesh or the Spirit of God. Romans 8, 6, and 7. Can you pop that in? For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So the characteristics of the carnal mind are death. Now, I know that when we think about death, and I've, I've preached several funerals over the last two weeks, and, and, but uh, <laughs> death refers ultimately to a spiritual death, the death that is eternal. But it shows up early as separation from God. The first time when the Lord told Adam and Eve, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I forgot to get back with you on that, but I will. Just something Brother Shannon asked me that just popped into my head right now. But the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he said, if you eat of it, you will surely die. Well, Brother Terrence, we know they didn't die right then, but we do know that they're separated from God and they got kicked out of Eden. So what is that? That is separation from God for us, separation from God. Now, I got to tell you, I don't really know what that's like because I don't know that there's ever been a time in my life that I was completely separated from him. All right? What happens, the only way you can be completely separated from God is if you want to be. And I, as, as ornery as I've been at times in my life, Brother Larry, I never could say, I don't want the Lord messing with me no more. I never could say, I don't want to feel convicted anymore. All right? But if you don't want the Lord meddling in your life, he won't. Okay? He won't. So, Adam and Eve, they, we are separated from God and we are separated also from our created purpose. Hear me when I tell you, I will stand on this unequivocally. You and I will never be fulfilled, never be happy, never be joyful doing anything less than what God made us to do. So what we have to do is find that. Now we're working on that in elements. We're working on that, and I hope you're working on that on your own, and you're stepping out there a little bit on faith and, and, uh, and, and trying out some things. Okay. Now, the characteristics of the carnal mind are death, so that's separation from God and from my created purpose. They're also enmity against God, and that word enmity literally translated means hatred. 
but it is better defined, I'll never forget when I read this, it is better defined as the opposite of what Jesus is. It is, in effect, what the spirit of Antichrist is, which is to be the polar opposite of the love of God. So this enmity means that I want to get as far away from God as I can. And I am, and it begins in my mind. Okay, enmity against God. That's characteristics of the carnal mind. Another characteristic of the carnal mind, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, means the carnal mind is rebellious. So when we buck against God, we are being rebellious. The carnal mind is rebellious against God. And when I'm rebellious against God, it's not just that I want to have my way, it's I want to do everything that's contrary to what he wants me to do. Kind of like when we're bad little kids. And mama says, clean your room. And you will find about 35 things more important to do than clean your room. Y'all remember that? Okay, that's kind of like what we do when we get in the way, the carnal mind getting us away from God. So, and another, the last characteristic of the carnal mind is hopelessly unsubmitted. There is not any hope for the carnal mind to ever be submitted to God unless it changes. Got to change your mind. Nor... Can you flow in the anointing reserved for the submitted if you are unsubmitted to God in your mind? The carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. You cannot all of a sudden be so stubborn that God's going to change around and do things your way. Somebody said, I'm still trying. Okay, now the characteristics of the spiritual mind or the spiritual minded is life and peace. And that's simply, first of all, being in the presence of God, fulfilling your created purpose and bringing forth fruit without the struggle. Being who God wanted you to be without trying hard to be. I love that concept. Being who God... When you get into alignment, Brother Ronnie, you start being fruitful in the kingdom of God without even trying. Okay? We align, get in alignment with God. So the spiritual mind is life and peace. Means I'm doing what God wanted me to do and there's no conflict. Okay? It's in the love of God. Obviously, enmities out of the love of God. So it's in the love of God, which means I have perfect harmony. But also, what does the perfect love of God do? Cast out all fear. So now I'm not living afraid anymore, but I'm living in faith. Okay. Characteristics of the spiritual mind are being in alignment with God. That means working with him and not against him, both in your own life and in working on his mission in your world. We will help everybody find out what God wants me to do in the world I live in. And then, rather than being hopelessly unsubmitted, the spiritual-minded person will be purposefully and completely surrendered to the will of God. Completely Surrendered to the will of God. Submitted totally and completely to the will of God. Now, I'm going to give this disclaimer before I move any further. Everything I'm going to be covering is in the word of God. Okay? It's the, it's the word of God. The carnal mind. What's the carnal mind? Let's see if we learned anything. Somebody help me. What's the carnal mind? It's not just the flesh. But it's, it's what the flesh wants to do, satisfying me, meeting my wants and my needs. I put them in quotes for a reason. Because if the book is right, if my God will supply all my needs, then really he's the one that decides what I really need. Okay, there we go. 
All right, the carnal mind is when I'm serving myself. And in effect, the spiritual mind is when I'm serving the Lord. The carnal mind will never lead you to God. It leads us away from God. Now, I'm going to paint a picture here. In the book of Romans, chapter number 1, verses 18 to 32, I'm going to paint you a little picture here of what happens to anybody who persist in being carnally minded. Okay? Now, who's the book of Romans written to? Church folks. All right? This is a warning. We're, we're going to offer hope at the end of this. Sister Heidi, I, I believe I'm going to get to the end. I'm just holding on by faith. The carnal mind leads you away from God. Now, there are those sitting among us. I harbor no illusions. There are those sitting among us right now that our lives are carnally minded. Even our church part. You come to church to be seen by somebody else or to satisfy somebody else. Do good things so somebody sees you and brags on you. So before you start trying to, Brother Chris, one thing we like to do is we like to compartmentalize bad sinners and me. When I would venture to, to, to if I would, would just step out right here on faith, I would say that part that I was talking about being carnally minded, living for God, some of us struggle with it without even realizing it. But the Holy Ghost just came through Pastor GL to tell you, you know what? I need to make some changes. Because if I'm doing things to be seen or to be bragged on, that's the only reward I'm getting. Okay? It's carnally minded. But the carnal mind, the smallest opening of the carnal mind leads you away from God. Verse 18 of Romans chapter 1. For the wrath of God, boy, I like this. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. I think, whoo, the wrath of God is going to be poured out against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. I'm not going to unpack that, all right? But here's what that is. People who keep on being bad, though they know better. All right. But I want you to get this picture. The wrath of God. What if we talk, how many, there's even been movies called The Wrath of God, I think. All right. There, there's a, I know there's a book talked about the wrath of God. There was an Israeli operation back years and years ago called The Wrath of God. But if, if we started saying something about the wrath of God, what would you think? How would you picture a God of wrath? Angry, punisher, there you go, a judge. We kind of picture him as we get mad, okay? That's not true. We cannot see the wrath of God through the wrath of GL or Johnny or Tara or Leanne or Marcus, all right? Because God doesn't get mad because you crossed him. He doesn't get mad. Y'all know I like saying this part. He don't, he don't get mad because you say your mama to him. He don't get mad because you give him the finger. He don't get mad because you cut him off in traffic. He don't get mad because he got to wait in line too long at Walmart. So why does God get mad? Why is the wrath of God going to be loosed against unrighteousness and ungodliness? Now, my, 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 my beautiful bride just said, because we don't do what we're supposed to. Yes, but really no. You know why he gets so angry and he gets so wrathful and judgmental is because he knows 
Sin is going to kill you if he doesn't get in the way. He knows what sin is going to do to you because he knows what the devil wants to do to you. And the only weapon the devil has is sin. And the reason why sin is so powerful is because it caters to me. And the Lord knows that he's, whoo, I feel a little spirit moving in here right now. The Lord, no, you got a three-year-old little boy, okay? You just started letting him play in the front yard just a little bit. Man, I, got, I feel a little spirit moving, I do. And you let him run around in the front yard just a little bit, but your phone buzzes. And you pull it out to look at it for about three and a half seconds, which is all it took for him to boom into the street. You do not say, can I put you on hold for a minute? <laughs> hey, come back here. No, you drop your phone, kick your flip-flops off, and burn it to the street, and though he's even an innocent little boy, you grab him, and I promise you, there's wrath in your spirit. Huh? Ain't playing games. I didn't even look for cars. All I'm doing is burning it out there because I know how much danger there is in the street. That's what the wrath of God is designed to do. Okay, is to get in the way of what sin is doing in our life. And you got to know, if I keep on doing this, judgment's coming. Okay, and it's not because the Lord just wants to be the boss. It's because the Lord wants me to find what he's got for me. And, and sin's in the way of that. Now, we, I believe, I believe that we've almost got everybody convinced God's got something for you. God's got a ministry for you. God's got a work for you. God's got a plan for you to do. The body is incomplete until you show up. And I'm going to preach it until we get it, Brother Terrence. But sin causes you, you know, Brother Cody, Adam and Eve were made for the garden. Sin got them kicked out of the garden. Remember, we preach about this a lot too. Remember Jesus Christ stood looking over Jerusalem. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Oh, I wanted to protect you. I wanted to cover you. I wanted to be God for you, but you wouldn't let me. You would not. Okay. Okay. Devil brings all that junk in your life because he's scared of you. The enemy's intimidated by you. Your testimony, man. When the blood of the lamb and your testimony line up together, you're going to overcome. Huh? Huh? And you stop loving your life so much that you don't let God use you. All right. Verse number 19 or 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it to them. Everybody that lives has been shown there's a God. I'm going to prove it to you, okay? I'm going to prove it to you. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, who he is, so that they are without excuse. Now here's the deal. What does that mean? Leave that scripture up there for just a minute. Here's what that means. From the beginning, every human being that has started thinking rationally 
realizes when they walked outside and the sun lit up the world, they didn't have nothing to do with it doing that. Ain't got nothing to do with the sun. Somebody put it there. And in nighttime when the moon is out, they sit there and look, reckon who put that out there? It wasn't me. Rivers and streams, mountains, the way the body works, the, you know, we, 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 don't, we don't wake up in the morning and decide to breathe. You just do it. And then nobody teach me to do it. It's something natural. And so when I finally start realizing, you know what? There's somebody bigger than me. There's somebody more powerful than me. It ain't me and it ain't you. It's, it's somebody bigger than you and I. And what it does, Sister Maria, is it witnesses to us. There's a God. Say, well, I think it happened this way, and I think it happened that way. You don't know, and neither does anybody else, but the Bible gives us a pretty good plan of it. And the Bible, the Bible plan, Brother Blake, lines up with science. Study it. It does. It does. Even if, even if the Big Bang is true, it might be true. Because when he said, let there be, you know what happened? Bang. I mean, really? So the, the truth is, if we will get beside of ourselves a little bit and get out of our own being wrapped up in our own little cocoon of the world, we will have to acknowledge Somebody out there bigger than me. Okay? And he's got to be powerful. And I can't see him. So it must be God. But then, okay, but then, verse 21 says, so they knew God. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. So here's what happened. When they came to the realization that there was a God, they refused to worship him. The beginning of the carnal mind taking them away was a refusal to worship. Him. They didn't stop worshiping. They just didn't worship the one true God. Say why. Can I tell you why? I don't have this in my notes, but I'm just going to minister a little bit. You want to know why people stopped worshiping the true God and started worshiping other gods? They wanted one they could see. They felt like they were weird because they were the only ones worshiping a God they didn't have an image of. They were the only ones worshiping one God. So they began to make them a few. Well, I got ahead of myself. So, so, is everybody with me? So, they refused to worship him. Then they became unthankful. So in their minds, they begin to conjure up man-made ideas about who God was. And if you, can, if you can dream up who God is, then you can also make him be what you want him to be. Okay. Why do you think, oh, God help me. I promise I ain't going to be nasty or nothing. But why do you think every one of these cotton-picking gods that people dreamed up, Aphrodite and Zeus and all of them, they end up in the bedroom worshiping them? It's true. It all ends up being a sexual thing. Why do you think that is? Because that's what they wanted. 
It's carnal, absolutely. That's what they want to read about it. Every one of them has some kind of a sexual escapade with it. And by the time of Jesus Christ, they had even turned worship into prostitution or prostitution into worship. The, the, the temple of Diana had somewhere around a thousand prostitutes slash priestesses. Okay, I got ahead of myself a little bit, but I just want you to get a picture. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you what this Bible is fixing to show us is left to ourselves, we are nuts. I know that's not politically correct to say, but it's true. It's true. Okay. Whew. When they came to realization there was a God, they refused to worship him. They became unthankful, and they began in their imagination to conjure up man-made ideas about who God was and what his will was, which just leads to greater deception because once you go and start going down that trail, you ain't coming back. All right? Not unless you, somebody, the wrath of God, the judgment of God brings something down into your life where you say, time out. This ain't cutting it no more. I need help. Look here, verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. The arrogance that is birthed in self-worship deludes one to the point that they become more and more and more foolish. Oh, mercy. Here's what they did. And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Think about this. They took things that God made, gold, man can't make it, silver, man can't make it, wood, I know man tries, but that fake stuff ain't wood. Trees grow because God wants them there. Rocks, God makes it. You say, well, what about concrete? Where do you think it comes from? Rocks. It's where it comes from in the first place. And water, man sure enough can't make that. They'll tell you, people will tell you, we better watch out water because there's only a limited supply. Man can't make no more. So they took a bunch of things that God made and turned them into gods. They thought they were the baddest men in town. Who can fix the most beautiful, wonderful image, uh, uh, you know, millions of dollars out of these, and we're going to bow down and worship them. And the Lord is saying, see that ruby right there? I stuck that over in that hill before they found it. See that gold right there? I'm the one that said, Psh, put that gold right there. They took things that I made, things that only exist because I let them exist and made a God out of it. They made images of man. They made images of animals. They made images of birds. And they made images of snakes. And when they felt like that they had made all the images they could, they made one half man and half animal. And then they made one half man and half bird. And half man and half snake. And they just began to try to get goofier and goofier with worship when all they really had to do, Marcus, uh, is go back and say, I believe there's only one out there. That's all they had to do. But, but you understand that the, uh, Brother David's taught about this, the insanity of sin turns into a locomotive running headlong like a snowball rolling downhill. How, how many in here can testify and say, boy, I thought I had it under control till I woke up one day and I was lost. Till I woke up one day and it done got out of control and I wanted to pump the brakes, but guess what? They ain't got none. And I realized the very thing I started worshiping became my God. Okay. 
We're talking about the carnal mind leads away from God. This is holiness. Verse 24. Wherefore, God also gave them up. I don't like that. I don't like that word. That, that makes me feel sad. God gave them up to uncleanliness, to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Now, we're fixing to find out there's three times in this passage that says God gave them up. Now, God does not force anybody to sin, ever, ever. He doesn't tempt you with sin. He doesn't make you sin. But you're going to like this, Miss Jane. You might want to write it down for your little study or your devotional that you use this passage in. But what happened is God removed the healthy restraint of grace. Because the Bible says... The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Titus 2, 11 and 12. What happens when grace ain't teaching you no more? Where's your checks and balances at? We live in a world, ladies and gentlemen, that has none. Now, we can, we can, as we have been known to do, right now, start climbing up on our high horse and looking down our nose at these, at these big dummies we're talking about. Wrong. You know what this better do, Sister Sheila? It better drive us to a place of prayer. And it better drive us to a place of intercession. And it better arouse compassion down inside of us that says this world is lost and they don't know what they're doing, but I do. I found the way, Brother Jerry. I found the truth. You didn't find it because you're special. You didn't find it because you're rich. You found it because the grace of God reached down into you generally because somebody, somebody stood in the gap for you. When the Lord was ready to lower the boom, Abraham, Abraham was interceding even for Sodom. And before you were about to go down for the last time, somebody said, Lord, have mercy on my baby. Lord, have mercy on my son, on my husband, on my wife. The Lord hears prayer. And if you're here tonight, I, I said it Thursday, I said it Sunday, probably going to say it a whole lot. I'm not senile and I haven't got dementia, so don't think I'm, I'm repeating it because I want to. You're here tonight because you're winning. You're here tonight because you got hope. Now, I don't really feel like it. I don't think it. You're here. And you know why you're here? Because you've been kept by the power of God. First Peter chapter number one. It says it. It says it. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. It, it is us. And the only thing is, is remember we talked the first time, hang with me a little bit. We talked the first time about the continuum. You remember that? The carnal mind gets you, the carnal mind doesn't take you from holy to lost in one step. But it will get into control and it will get into uh, putting on a show like we were talking about earlier. And it'll get where to the point where we will say to ourselves, not literally, but we're really saying it, you know what? 
I believe I've been here long enough to sit back and take her easy. There was a fellow in the Bible that did that. He said, you know what? I'm rich. And I got, matter of fact, this year, I'm going to get richer. So I'm going to tear down my old barns and build some bigger barns. That's kind of what, and then what did the Lord say to him? Thou fool, this night thy soul is going to be required of thee. Okay. God gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. When the Lord removed the healthy restraint of grace, without which man's depravity knows no limits. The Spirit of God and the grace of God serve as a governor of sorts. Is anybody beside me don't like governors? I'm not talking about Governor Parsons. I'm talking about just as soon as you got a lawnmower back in the day, you probably know what I'm talking about, Brother Chris, or as soon as you got a go-kart, they got it governor down. And the first thing you got to do, Brother Terrence, is you got to get a screwdriver and back that rascal off. Right? Why? We don't want it to be slowed down. We don't want nobody telling us how fast we can go. But Sister Maria, there's a day coming of revelation for everybody when they realize the governor is safe. The governor is safe. It's put in my life not to make me miserable, but to protect me and to keep me where God wants me to be. All right. Now, when it says they dishonor their own bodies, I felt like I needed to say this. It means disrespecting yourself. It literally means disrespecting your own body. That's a message I preach to people. I preach it to my kids. I preach it to people. Respect yourself. And here's what the devil will tell you. I'm, I just feel this in the Holy Ghost right now. The devil will tell you you've already done so much bad Ain't no sense in changing now. Let me tell you something, honey. That's a lie from hell. I'm telling you right now, the Lord, the Lord can make you so that you are physically as pure as a driven snow. Oh, I feel Holy Ghost moving in here right now because the devil will tell you you don't need to listen to what he's saying. It don't apply to you because you've been too bad. We know what you did. We know what you did. I want you to know it applies to everybody in here. If I can just get to the end, I'm going to show you. Look here. Yeah, I heard Brother Shannon got faith in me. So God gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. If you ain't married, you need to stop having sex. I, I didn't give it like two amens. This is what it's talking about. Okay, and this is what it's talking about. They dishonor their own bodies between themselves. They begin to just sleep with whoever and whenever and however with, with, didn't matter who it was. Everybody just, the air just went out of this place. <laughs> Look here. They changed the truth of God into a lie. They started it in the hippie days. How can something that feels so good be bad? Well, because the Lord said you can't. And where does that lead you? Where does that take you? All right. They changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So here's what happened. They realized there's a God out there because he made everything, but we don't like it because we need a God we can touch. 
So they made all these images and made all these idols and began to bow down and worship them. They began to sacrifice. They sacrificed their children to them, and we don't have time to get into all of that. But they turned the truth of God into a lie. Everybody say a lie. A lie. They traded. That word changed means traded or bartered away the truth of God for a lie. Now hear me. I know I'm going to get in trouble tonight. I done thought... There's the wrong person going to see this online and they're going to have me on CNN in the morning. <laughs> and I'm going to get sued. I got insurance for that. Look at here. I've been hearing this out in the world. Please note that the Bible says they changed the truth of God to a lie, not another truth. They didn't make a new truth. They traded truth for a lie. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. Look here, looking through this lens, it's not truth, but it's a lie. The culture in which we live, somebody coined this phrase, and they, they say it all the time, especially from a Hollywood perspective, when people start talking about my truth, as if there is a truth that's only for you. Did anybody else heard that? You heard people talking about that? I found my truth. Honey, you ain't got no truth. You don't have any truth. There's only one truth, and that's from the one who made us. He made us to live a certain way. He made us to function a certain way. He made us to love a certain way. <laughs> but we didn't like it. We didn't like it because it didn't suit us. So, but I'm going to say this again. Until today, Every time I read on my Yahoo page or somewhere like that or see something on the news, which if I do, it's an accident because I don't watch the news. But sometimes people be sending me stuff. And the, every time I hear somebody say, well, live your truth, I get mad. I ain't going to get mad no more. I'm going to get compassionate now. And if the Lord will help me keep my right mind, even if they're famous and they'll never know who I am, have anybody ever prayed for somebody on TV before or something? Huh, I have. I'm going to start doing it more because you know something, Sister Dana? I'm going to have to get compassionate for them because if they're trying to live their truth, they're really believing a lie. Okay. Hey, you start getting close to the Lord, it's amazing how good of a Christian it'll make you. The manifestation of trading the truth of God into a lie and worshiping and serving the creature more than the creator, the creator is eternal, incorruptible, and strong, and all that's created is temporal, corruptible, and weak. So 26, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. There's that phrase, God gave them up again. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And I didn't understand what that last phrase meant and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat and I began to pray and I began to search and I began to look for it and I realized this is what the Bible says. Please don't think that you can take the word over the world over the word of the Bible. Here's what the Bible says. The greatest suffering for those caught up in this kind of behavior is happening on the inside of them. And the struggle that they're having on the inside is commensurate 
with the magnitude of the act in which they're involved, looking at receiving in themselves that recompense of their error. It would tell me that the Bible says that the Lord doesn't let anybody participate in such acts without convicting them. Y'all scared I'm going to be on CNN too, ain't you? <laughs> it's the word of God. Say, yes, sir. Uh huh. That's what I, I think, Brother Skipper. That's what that scripture's saying right there. And again, that's going to have to give birth to some compassion inside of us. How many people are out there that, whoo, man, I promise I feel the anointing on me tonight. How many people that we will look down our nose at? But the Lord is telling us right now, I don't care how much they're smiling, how much they're holding up signs, I don't care how much they're talking bad about Christians, the Bible says they got a war going on inside of them. Sure. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yep. Sure. Yep. Right, right. I, I, I wrote it down, Sister Maria, and I erased it, and I wrote it down, and I erased it, and I wrote it down. And then the more I searched, the more, do you see, do you see that, Brother Ronnie? Do you see that in them and receiving in themselves that recompense? Do you know what that word recompense means? Getting them back is happening in them, in them. Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, thank God he feels convicted because they're supposed to. They're not supposed to feel condemned. That don't come from heaven. But the pull that says I can do better, I can be better, I can be healed, I can be delivered, that's God. Remember I told you all this. Condemnation says you're done. You're no good. You're useless. Wrote you off. Conviction says you're better than that. That's right. You're better. You got more. I'm going to lift you up. I'm not going to smash you down. I'm going to lift you up. And the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. There is When you put condemn sign on an old house, it means it's uninhabitable. And that's what the devil will make you think you are. But the Holy Ghost came in tonight to tell you, we're going to turn it around. We're going to turn that around. Now, this is where you're headed if you don't turn around. It's what the carnal mind does. Don't think you can play games with the devil. I, 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 you, you can't play tiddlywinks with the devil without getting roped into something much deeper. Okay. Even as they did not like, here we go, here's the holiness of the mind, verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, where's your knowledge live? In your mind. They wanted God out of their mind. They wanted also, kind of like what Sister Shelley just said, 
Don't talk to me about it. Stay away from me. I don't want to hear it. I don't preach that stuff to me. I don't want to listen to no Jesus music. I don't want nobody reading the Bible to me. Please leave me alone and let me be a sinner. If you got the Holy Ghost, you ain't got that option. But they decided they didn't want to keep God in their mind. So God gave them over to a reprobate mind. This is a dangerous place. To do those things which are not convenient. Those things you weren't made for. Look here. Seeing they thought it foolishness to acknowledge God. They in effect decided to remove all godly influence from their minds and of course their lives. And God turned we're going to take what Sister Dana said and take it to a whole new level. God turned them over to a reprobate mind, and a reprobate mind is one whose moral compass is broke, and they no longer know right from wrong. They will call wrong right and right wrong. They don't know. Being filled with all unrighteousness, verse 29 that word, I, I'm going to go through this very quickly. I didn't put all the definitions. Sister Heidi may have it up there. I don't know. But I, I want to give them to you. Being filled with all unrighteousness. Unrighteousness is defined as everything that violates God's standards. Fornication, which is all immoral sexual sin. Wickedness, the same word as iniquity or lawlessness. Covetousness, that's what you're filled with when you're turned over to a reprobate mind. Wanting more than God wants you to have. Covetousness, not trusting God, wanting more than God wants you to have. Maliciousness, a wicked disposition. Full of envy, that's spite. That means everybody you see that's got something, you get sour grapes over it. Spite. Then murder, that's literal. That means you want to kill people, whether it's physically, literally, or just with your words. Look at here, debate. You got that up there? Yep, there it is, down at the bottom, debate. Want to argue with everybody about everything. Oh, Lord. Deceit, trickery, malignity. You know what that means? It means they turn into a cancer. Everywhere they go, things get worse, not better. Whisperers, yep, you got it right, gossiping. Backbiters, that means slanderous. Haters of God. I think I'm in verse 30 now. Haters of God, that means you despise the will of God. Generally, that shows up, I'm finding, that shows up and getting mad at the preacher, generally, because you decide he's picking on you. Somebody say amen or something. Amen. There, thank you. Thank you. I don't want y'all to think, you know. Look at here. Despiteful. That means they're damaging with a nasty spirit. Proud means arrogant or disdainful of others. Boasters. Yeah. Self-promotion, that's usually a lie. Inventors of evil things mean coming up with all things of the most evil kind. Disobedient to parents. Why are we surprised when we're having problems with kids that won't mind? The Bible said it's a sign of the end time. We got to fight against it with the power of the Holy Ghost. Look at here. Without understanding means foolish in an immoral sense. Covenant breakers, you just won't keep your word. You can't be trusted. Without natural affection means immoral and unnatural feelings of affection. Implacable, it means won't even listen to talking that makes sense. Unable to be talked sensibly to. Unmerciful means cruel. Verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, here we go, Brother Skipper. That's what this scripture right here. Who knowing the judgment of God 
that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do they do them, but they watch other people do them on TV. but have pleasure in them that do them. Now, I don't know what, what I, I'm, I'm going to call her quits and finish up later, make, make another small lesson and finish up later. But how in the world can anybody read the Bible and say, I don't believe God cares what we do. I don't believe God cares how we live. And we learned tonight that the reason why he cares is it's going to stop us. It's going to hinder us. And it's ultimately going to kill us. That's why he's calling, come do this my way. But you know something the Bible says, Brother Jerry? The Bible says, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life and few there be that find it. Why? Because it's contrary to your flesh. But the wide gate, the broad way, you know what it says about that? Lots of folks traveling that way. Holiness of the mind. What I painted for you tonight was a picture of where we will end up if we don't guard our minds. I can't let that in my mind. I can't let that live in my head. I can't, I cannot. You know how it got started, Brother Terrence? Every one of the guys that helps, helps me lead has come and talked to me at one time or another. Some of them have even said, I think you need to get somebody else to do that. I'm not doing a very good job. What's going on? About half of them won't never worship. Say, but I don't think that's a big deal. Looks to me like it might be, Brother Larry. Looks to me like that's the first step in toward going down the carnal path. Say, well, I don't like who's doing this and I don't like who's doing that. You ain't worshiping them. That's right. That's right. That's right. I'm worshiping him. You know what? One of my gravest enemies could start singing. I was so aimless, life filled with sin. I couldn't let my dear Savior in. You know what I'm going to start doing? I'm going to start clapping my hands, and I'm going to start singing with him. I saw the light. You know why, Brother Blake? I got to get rid of that old nonsense. I've come to worship the Lord. And I might have been going to preach this. I might have been going to preach it, but I, I, I might still be going to preach it. But they started singing praise songs at the very beginning tonight, and my heart was heavy. But I realized, Brother Blake, the first sound of victory is my praise. The first sound of victory. It was like the Lord spoke it into my spirit. I might preach it Sunday. If it's so, y'all just got a preview. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because yeah, because first you said I ain't never going to a Pentecost church. <laughs> and then he said, and then he said, Well, I came, but I ain't gonna act like them. <laughs> so that's what he said. <laughs> and he's told You know something? It ain't nothing that I, it ain't no Pentecostal choreography where you just join in. You, you know, like the Pentecostal hokey pokey or something? Raise your right hand, raise your left hand, bounce around in a circle. No, no, no. Just, but when I start, when I, they started singing that stuff, <coughs> man, it does something to me. It does something to me, man. I can't, I can't just sit there and be quiet. Because if I do, Brother Blake, the devil thinks he won. 
And if he starts thinking he wins enough, he's going to get confidence. I want the devil to know he's a loser seven days a week. I want him to know he ain't got no hope of winning because I know where my help is. I know where my hope is. I, I know my Redeemer lives. I know the lifter of my head. And so I started singing my own little song right here in the middle of something. Something else was going on, but I do it sometimes. You know what it was? Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit. Forever I pray with fathomless billows of love. You know something, Marcus? It's just a few seconds into praising him that I, the, the load just starts lifting. It just starts lifting. And so I said all that to say this. Whatever's going on with you, don't stop worshiping. Don't stop praising him. Don't stop clapping your hands and telling him how good he's doing. Because it's the first sound of victory is praise on your lips. Oh, yes, ma'am. Something in me has to. Yes, that's it. And look, go ahead. If we get out late, it's Brother Ronnie and Sister Heidi's fault. You may have remembered one Sunday I took a lap. Uh huh. Yeah. And about five minutes into the story, I realized that it was almost like me speaking German <laughs> to two people that, that didn't understand my enthusiasm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it didn't bother me a bit. Uh-huh. <laughs> and as they both kind of eased away from me. <laughs> well, Sister Heidi, in a manner of speaking, you said it just a while ago. I praise him because I'm glad to be alive. Because he saved me. I tried to mess it up. I tried to do it my way. I'm, I'm ashamed to tell you that, that I've wrestled and wallowed around in some of that slop I talked about tonight. As soon as I called on his name, just as soon as I said, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry. It was like he was waiting on that all the time because he was, because he was. Stand with me if you would. Thank you for coming tonight. I love every one of you. To our guest, we love you before you came. You made us better when you came in here. You did. You made us better. You're bringing something we didn't have, and that was you. Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock worship. Sunday night's our rally. Please come and be a part of that. And uh, be in prayer. Lots of people going through struggles this week. We should not be surprised. We should not be surprised. When revival comes, the old saying is, when the Lord starts blessing, the devil starts messing but he don't have the end of the story. We do. He doesn't have any authority or power. We do. And greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. We love you. Thank you for coming tonight. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.